So the single biggest theological project that Balthazar did in terms of published project was his trilogy. Um, so uh, multiple volumes in each part, but it had three parts. The first part was the theological aesthetics. The second part was theological dramatics, theodrama. And then the third part is the theological logic. Now again, this is something that's very, stands out as a very strange way to do things. It's not a familiar ordering. In particular, so, so the theological aesthetics is looking at questions of beauty. Um, the theodrama is looking at the action of God in relation to the world, seeing it in the categories of drama. It's like a play. Um, and then the logic is where he turns to questions of truth and method. So it's, it's a bit the reverse of the way most theologians would think of operating. You might think about first specifying how you know things, where, you know, where the truth lies, what your method's going to be, and then you might think you would get to the central themes of systematic theology. And then if you're going to do anything about aesthetics, you might think it comes as an afterthought. Balthazar thought that this was one of the things that was wrong with modernity, that people did not pay enough attention to beauty and that beauty needed to become at the beginning. Because if you weren't drawn to God, if you couldn't see the beauty of Revelation, then you'd not be interested in its truth, or you'd not be interested in pursuing the good if you couldn't see the intrinsic beauty of goodness. So that beauty, he wants to say, is, is, is very fundamental. And so you can see the theological aesthetics as his equivalent, though, to a traditional starting point in fundamental theology. Fundamental theology is a discipline that you only get within Roman Catholicism, but it's sort of trying to explain um, why Christians believe in revelation, it's sort of general questions, not quite apologetics, but something like apologetics. Why believe it all? How does belief work? And so on. And Balthazar is saying, don't start with general proofs of the existence of God, and don't start with proofs of why we should accept revelation or how we know that um, you know, miracles make uh, revelation credible or anything like that, which had been traditional in Catholic theology. Start by getting people to see the beauty of Revelation. That's your starting point. So it still is a starting point. How, how do we, it's, it still is a, is, is a way in, in seven volumes for Balthazar, to try to see um, the, the beauty of Revelation. Balthazar uses the category of beauty quite freely, but if you try to pin him down on what he thinks beauty is, then and one thing that's very central to his notion of beauty is the form, the gestalt, which is kind of like the, the overall shape uh, of something. And he thinks that beauty has two parts. It has form and it has splendor, a kind of shining out at you. And the two things are, are, um, are interlinked, or are, are, are not interlinked. Um, the form and the splendor are always met together. They're not really separable. Um, so I think a central image in, in Balthazar's first part of his trilogy is that what happens in Revelation is analogous to what happens if you're standing before a beautiful work of art, that um, you're taken out of yourself, you're overcome by its beauty, uh, and, you sim and you see the whole of it, and you recognize it. You don't, you don't work your way up step by step to deduce at the end that it's a beautiful work of art. It's just something that happens to you. And this notion of beauty, it's a very important one for Balthazar, I think, in in getting beyond certain bad alternatives that theologians often face. That you might say, is revelation a set of truths outside of you that assent to? Then what, what you might say, is, is it just this objective thing out there? Then what intrinsic link does it have to me? This is a problem some theologians face. But if you say, well, actually, it's all a matter of my experience, then you might seem to undercut the objectivity and the reality of revelation. And Balthazar, I think, with his, with his um, analogy of beauty, has a, has a wonderful way between these two things. Because if you see a work of art and it's beautiful, it really is beautiful, let's suppose, unless we're going to be real relativists. It is beautiful, but it's very much, I very much experience it out of beautiful. I don't experience it by me sitting back and deciding about the nature of experience in general. It's a particular thing. It hits me. I've never seen it before, but I respond. So it's experiential, but at the same time, it's out there and objective. So we can have a way of talking about revelation that makes it neither disconnected from life nor the product of something we always already knew. So the danger with one of his, um, with Karl Rahner, let's say, who was working around the same time, people worried that with his emphasis on experience, there would be no room for the new in revelation. It was something we always already had, we always already knew. For Balthazar, Revelation hits us, it sort of slams into us as something we experience, like a, a work of art does. 
but it can be, still be new because this is the way art works. It's the newness that affects you. This emphasis that Balthazar has on beauty and particularly on, on, on things having a form and that you have to appreciate the whole of the form to appreciate beauty. So if you see the Mona Lisa, you don't appreciate its beauty by taking the nose first and analyzing that and then looking at the ear and then building up an argument, nor do you appreciate the beauty of the Mona Lisa by uh, you know, saying how exactly to the, you know, what's the chemistry behind the pigments of this particular culture. You, you see the whole and you either appreciate it or you miss it. Now, he thinks it's the same thing with revelation. It needs to be, you need to see the form. Um, and so if you look at some kinds of historical criticism that have developed in the last few centuries, he thinks that these uh, kinds of criticism can, can murder to dissect to use. He doesn't use that cliche, but this is the cliche that, that they're so concerned to work out you know, what lies behind the text, what might have been its origins, how can we handle it chronologically, how can we describe different pericopes and so on, that you're working on a cadaver in the end and you miss the whole. So um, without denying the, uh, the possibility of doing historical criticism, Balthazar is a strong way of saying if you only do that of a certain kind, and of course he may be slightly caricaturing it sometimes, but if you only do that then you miss revelation and you would expect to miss revelation. So for Christians who might feel that their faith is in danger of being attacked and um, ripped apart, by the discoveries of historical criticism, Baltazar, Baltazar gives some comfort. Of course, if you're going to pick apart a text, you won't see what's most important in it. You need to see the whole. There's a lot of questions you can ask about Baltazar's introduction of beauty and aesthetics into theology. I mean, one question he asked is, how can we prevent this being a trivialization of theology, that you just play around with whatever you find most beautiful? And he thought that he could handle that problem by distinguishing between theological aesthetics and aesthetic theology and saying that actually in theological aesthetics you don't apply a previously determined aesthetic theory or sensibility to revelation. You allow revelation to teach you about aesthetics. Here he sounds a bit like Karl Barth and this is a, I think a point where he's influenced by Barth in, in different language. Um, there are other questions that can be asked about his theological aesthetics. For instance, how good is his concept of what beauty is? He, he just plucks it out as though this is what everyone has always said about beauty. Uh, is aesthetics actually all about beauty? There's lots of questions that can be asked and have been asked about this. But what's been very important is um, that Balthazar somehow really opened wide the doors of, of theological work with his theological aesthetics and suggested that maybe we can take literary texts, for instance, as a very serious theological source. So he's He's been a very positive influence on uh, helping people to begin to think about new ways of doing theology, wh whether or not at every stage he did it successfully himself. The second part of Balthazar's great trilogy is his theodrama. Uh, so, so he makes a transition by saying that um, a contemplation wonder, which is what you're talking about in beauty, this is, this is a part of Christian life, but it's not the whole of Christian life. There's also action. And so he moves on to action by using dramatic categories. Now again, this is a very unusual thing that he's done to cast all of what you might call systematic theology because he talks about Christology, anthropology, Mariology, the Trinity. He talks about all of that in the context of drama, theodrama. So, so what he does is, 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 is take the language of the play and an extensive series of metaphors from play, from, from theater, to, uh, to structure and, and think through ways about talking about God in God's self and God's action in the world and, and our, the place of our action. And the fact that there should be a place for our action is one of the central things that Balthazar is concerned with in the theodrama. Um, and to understand this, you need to look again at the influence of Karl Barth on him. In, in very many ways, he follows Karl Barth. But when he wrote a book on Barth, something that he thought was a central problem in Barth was that Barth did not leave enough room and importance for our response to what God did. You know, everyone other than Christ seems to become completely marginal, at least as, it may not be fair to Barth, but at least as Balthazar reads Barth. So something like a, a Christological concentration was too much in Barth, and everything else gets wiped away. And Balthazar wants to say, we're in a drama, Christ is the main actor, but there are bit parts for us. We also have our role in the drama. Um, so, so he uses the dramatic categories in part to, to, to find more room for, for our role, 
uh, after Christ, who still plays the central role um, 